um, month of January sermon series is really a short, not complicated, um, simple reminder this morning. That's it. It, wasn't a, it was enough that I couldn't wedge it into another sermon, but it's important enough that I didn't want to just throw it away and not talk about it. And I felt like it was a good way for us to end all of what we've been talking about all of these weeks about the necessity and the benefits and the mandate and the command given to us by God to take advantage of the community of God, the family of God, of what He's created us to be. Now, here's the deal we would make is that this morning is short and sweet and simple, but I want you to pay attention because the reminder... And the warning that we get from Scripture as we kind of cap off this series is serious, though. It's serious. You know, the way I want to start this is to tell a story. You know, in high school, I played all of what I consider to be the normal sports. You know, I was in uh, Louisiana and, and in the South, so I didn't play things like hockey. I don't consider that to be a normal sport. It just gets in the way of my sports center. Get this sport out of the way here. Hockey. Uh, I, I ran track. I played baseball. I played basketball, football. But my senior year of high school, I was forced to run cross country. That wasn't at the top of my list e either. Like, you know, my idea of a good time is to not go into the woods and run for three miles unless something's chasing me or someone's chasing me. But our basketball coach felt like it would be a good idea for our cardio if we also did cross-country season, and so we did that in South Louisiana. It was humid and hot. But here's what I discovered about cross-country. I was good at it. You know, I, at, at those that time in my life, I was lean. I didn't have any body fat. I did have good cardio. I'd been playing a lot of sports, and so I discovered, man, you know, without a lot of training, initially when I started, I'm, I'm okay at this. I can run decently okay. And I wasn't the best on the team, but what I discovered was that, you know, even without a lot of training, I could kind of finish middle of the pack. I could finish if I wanted to, exerted myself a little bit. I could, I could finish maybe toward the top quarter. I really never took it serious. And here's the, the culmination of the story. I decided for the first time to take a meet seriously. I waited until it was the regional meet to do this. We had run all these other little side meets that really didn't matter or anything. And the regional meet is this meet that if you can finish in the top 10 of this meet, you go to state. It's kind of a big deal. And so I just show up with no training at this regional meet, running all these other little things because I've been forced to run it, not taking it seriously. And I show up, and I decide at this regional meet that what I'm going to do, there's 150 people that line up and run this race at one time. I decide that I'm going to pick the number one and the number two guys, and I'm going to stand next to them when we start. And I just decide in my brain that I'm just going to stick with them for the whole three miles. Now let me just preface this one of these guys i knew he was on my team and so it didn't matter what meet we ran in this one guy from another school always finished first and the guy on our team always finished second and these guys were way ahead of us way ahead of us 150 people i never finished in the top 50 and i decide that at the regional meet the most important meet these are the best runners in the in the region i'm gonna stick with these guys and you know what that was my goal so when they blew the whistle and they blew their shot the gun and we started off i stuck right behind my friend jeremy he was the guy who was running in second place and i was with him for the first mile i was right on his heels it was awesome this thing started amazing i mean we're a third of the way in this race and i'm thinking man i'm looking around i'm like I, i'm third this is unbelievable. I'm doing okay right here. And even ignoring the, the, the counsel, the wise counsel of our coach who would be at every mile marker, I remember the very first mile marker when I passed him. He's like, slow down, Brad, slow down. You know, he had seen how I raced before, but in my mind, I'm thinking, it's all, it's all up here. You know, if I just convince myself up here. And here's when I discovered that that strategy was a colossal mistake. At a mile and a half mark, Jeremy turns around to me mid-running and utters this short phrase to me. He's like, all right, now let's go. That, that's, that's what he told me a mile and a half in. And in my brain, I'm thinking, what have we been doing? I, uh, have we not been going? Because this is the last gear I got. Then they did. They literally kicked it into another gear. And, and not just physically. Physically, I knew I've already used everything I got up. I mean, we're only halfway through. I ain't got nothing left in the tank. Matter of fact, it felt like another person had climbed on my back. I mean, it was just heavy. I couldn't run. And then just emotionally, I knew it. I knew in my head I've made a mistake, and there's no, there's no turning back from this thing. 
I think of that story, and there's a whole lot of other funny things I could share, because that's a story where I would look at it and say, we have a million of these, where you would look at a story and say, it started off so well and ended so bad. I remember coming across that finish line, and I was just throwing up everything under the sun and embarrassed, and it was, it was a, a, not the finish I really wanted. And I share that because this is what we're going to find in Hebrews chapter 3. The author of Hebrews is going to share a story infinitely better than the one I just shared with you. And it is a story of one that started out so colossally awesome and ended so terrible. You cannot believe it, and we would learn from it. Here's what I want you to see when we go to Hebrews chapter 3. And so just before we dive into verse 7 of chapter 3, let me give you a little update on what's happening here. The author of Hebrews is a mystery. We don't know who he is. We, uh, you know, a lot of people like to guess. They would say it's Paul or, or Barnabas or whoever. And I would say there's no point in us arguing about who wrote Hebrews. If God wanted us to know who wrote Hebrews, he would have told us who wrote Hebrews. But here's what I believe. I believe it was a pastor. Or at least it was a writer who had a pastor's heart because what he does in the book of Hebrews is he writes a sermon, really. And what he uses as his illustration for the sermon is the Exodus. He uses the Israelites. He uses the people of God routinely. He's telling the story of how God delivered the people of God from bondage and slavery to the Egyptians and how they lived and moved through the wilderness to make their way to this land that God has promised them. And he uses that as an illustration of our life now. We have been set free from the bondage of sin, and we are headed home. Every day right now is another step on a journey home to the promised land. But right now, make no mistake of it, as long as I'm on this planet, and until I'm sitting face to face with Jesus, I am in the wilderness right now. And he begins to write this book to tell us how should we navigate the wilderness. Now, the story of the Hebrew people, though, is one that starts off, when you think of this story that he begins to use as his illustration, it is an unbelievable beginning to the story. I mean, there's all kinds of details that we don't have time to go into, but I think of the night where they would have scattered blood over their doorposts, and and this, this destroyer would have come in and slaughtered all of the firstborn male Egyptian sons. And the next morning, I mean, just think about how fantastic the story is. The next morning, there would have been two unbelievably different reactions one from the egyptian people of wailing and grief over the loss of life and then for the israelite people though victory i mean they've been slaves for 430 years and and pharaoh was reluctant to let them go and they had seen miracle and miracle and plague and plague and finally with this when they stand in front of pharaoh who wouldn't let them go and he's begging them to leave asking them for a blessing is what he wants here they grab Joseph's, you can just see it, they grab Joseph's bones and, and be excited about the fact that they're going to march out of town and finally fulfill a promise to bring him into the promised land, his, his bones. It was absolutely victorious. And they see God do miracle after miracle after miracle. They get into the, the wilderness and there's pillars of s- smoke during the day and pillars of fire at night. Even when Pharaoh has a change of heart and wants to chase them down, God opens up the sea lets them pass through it he engulfs the armies he he provides for them manna from the sky and water from the rock i mean this is how this story started if you were a person of israel you would have seen god do all of these things and it would not have been hard to follow god at the beginning of this story that's a fact you would have seen all these things and said this god we we are going to follow this god Here's the thing about that fantastic story is that if we were to now fast forward ahead to almost the very end where they're about to go into the promised land, a lot of things have changed. I mean, this story that started just amazing and huge is here at the end of the story going to end very differently. I mean, there's a lot of different estimations on how many people, how many men were leaving bondage of slavery. Some would say some 650,000 people, some million and a half, men, women, and children. Let me just ask you, how many of the original men over the age of 20, by the time we get to the end, actually entered the promised land? Anybody want to take a guess? Somebody say it over here. Two. Two. Now there's a story that starts one way. Hundreds of thousands of people miraculously set free from bondage to slavery. And in the 
course of 40 years of the original men over the age of 20, only two, Joshua and Caleb, get to go in. Not even Moses. Now, there's a story that started really well and ended kind of cruddy, didn't it? Now, here's the question I have for you very simply. Very, I promised you, simple, short, sweet, very different than, than a normal sermon, but I want you to listen. What happened in between the beginning and the end? I mean, what happened to this group of people that I, had to be? God's working in such a powerful way. They are fired up. God is amazing. We will follow him to the ends of the earth to what's happening right before the end here. Let me give you a little bit of a, a bigger magnifying glass of what's happening here. Think about the, the evidence that we see in Numbers 13 and 14, what was happening. I mean, think about what was happening right when they finally get there. When they finally get to the, the promised land, they send the spies in. Do you remember that story? And all of the spies except for two came back. Well, actually, all of the spies came back and says the land is exactly like God described give us the report spies they're like it is flowing with milk and honey it's amazing problem it's also filled with these massive people and they're warriors and all but two of the spies Joshua and Caleb looked at the people and says we're grasshoppers. I know God's telling us to enter this land, and he's commanding us to, and he's giving it to us, but we would rather go back to slavery. Matter of fact, not only did they want to go back to slavery, they would rather depose their leaders, stone Caleb and Joshua. They would rather disobey than take the promises God's given them. The same God who has shown them who he is. They should have no doubts. They've seen him do miracle, 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 miracle. They're like, we'd rather go back and be slaves. And this was their pattern. From the moment they, they left, God proved who he was. I mean, I think of Exodus 14, 11. Just think of God. God says this, and the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me? in spite of all the signs that I've done among them. God was saying, how did we go from being a people who I've proved myself to? Parting seas, reigning man, promise after promise, delivering them from Pharaoh and killing of the firstborn and all these... <clears throat> what else do I have to do? What happened from these people who were so fervent for the Lord and the people who were wanting to turn their back on Him? Here's what it is. Lack of faith change of vision and spiritual drift lack of faith so from the beginning to the end they had a lack of faith that caused them to take their attention off of God and it sent them into spiritual what I like to call drift it just started to drift further and further and further away from God you know, I love it. John Piper says that this life that we live in is not a lake. It's a river. And the flow of this river is toward disobedience. And let me tell you something about drifting. I've never met anyone who drifted closer to God. I've never met anyone who took their hands off of the oars of God's word, who took their hands off of the spiritual habits of prayer and obedience and taken their vision off of Jesus Christ and somehow found themselves closer to him. I've never seen that happen. Because everything in this world that we live in is predisposed to be fundamentally opposed to the Lord Jesus. Everything in your sinful flesh is predisposed to be opposed to everything the Word tells us that we ought to be and do. And we take our hands off of it. We want to shut the Word like we learned last week. We want to take our eyes off of the author and perfecter of our faith. Let me tell you what, you will drift. You will drift. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You don't take your, take your eyes off of Jesus. Take your eyes off of his word. Let me tell you what, you will lack faith like we talked about this tightrope. And it will produce spiritual drift. And that's what this psalmist is going to be talking about here in chapter three, if you'll look with me. He uses the example of, of, of uh, beginning in verse seven all the way through verse 11. He uses the example of these Hebrew people right here. This is what he says in verse 7 of chapter 3. Look at this. 
Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. He's saying, remember the people of the Israelites, what did they do? They hardened their hearts. Let me tell you what spiritual drift does. It causes you to have hardened hearts towards sin. Crustiness toward the ways of God. He says, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test. What will spiritual drift do? It'll start to put God to the test. And saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. Drift in their heart. What happened to the people of God? They drifted. They went astray in their hearts. They gave over to sin because they took their attention off of him and put it on themselves or their circumstances or their fears or their wants or their selfish needs uses the example here and he says you know what here's what will happen to all of us the example that the author of hebrews 3 is trying to give to us and the encouragement and the reminder and the warning this morning is simply this it is a short path (coughs) from your spiritual high moment and your spiritual exodus moments to falling away is a short path And for anybody in the room who thinks you're off limits from falling away and drifting away from Jesus, be warned this morning. Be warned. Spiritual drift isn't just something that happens to the people of Israel. I mean, I love it. I know of of all the time people would say, you know, if I had been in the presence of Jesus, people tell me that all the time. If Jesus were living with me, walking around the earth with me, man, I would never turn my back on them. It, would, it must have been easy for those first disciples and I always remind them of Judas I mean Judas is living proof that you could be in the presence of Jesus and see him do miracles and not believe who he really is and, and walk away from him the same thing's true with the, the people of God in Israel I mean they they live on the high of his miracles they've seen God do undeniable miracles and yet if they take their attention off of him and get more focused on their circumstances and themselves what will happen drift they will drift away from him and the longer you drift the more hard you get and the harder it is to get back. <coughs> Think of a story from a couple years ago. You might remember this. There was a couple ladies who went hiking the Appalachian Trail a couple years ago. You may have read this. And it may not even been two years ago. And that was the advice. You know, I'm not, again, I'm not a really a hiker. That's not my idea of a good time. But they had set out to go hike the Appalachian Trail, which you're always supposed to do in groups, never by yourself. And they got about halfway through with the hike, and something came up where one of the ladies had an emergency and she had to shut down her hike and what should have happened for the remaining lady is that she would have been smart to say we're going to pause the trip and I'm not going to go any further by myself but she decided that she was going to continue the trip by herself and so they said bye to one another and she continued down the trail and everything was going fine for another couple hours until later in the day she made one very small very simple but a devastating mistake she decided to step off of the trail so that she could go find somewhere to use the restroom. And she lost sight of the trail, just thinking, I'm going to make one little simple detour here. I'm just going to step off the trail for a little bit and wander around and find a good place. And once she found a place to use the restroom and got done, she had realized she had lost sight of the trail and didn't think about it and didn't know where it was anymore totally lost she started to text people but couldn't get a signal and they they recovered those texts where she's saying look i've wandered off the trail i don't even know where i'm at anymore and for the next weeks to a month she wandered around and could not find her way back to the trail to the point where they finally found her body dead in her sleeping bag and the irony is she was only one mile away from the trail But she had wandered off of it, lost sight of it, and the more and more she walked around and the more she drifted and got away from it, she couldn't find her way back. Here's the the lie of the enemy is that, you know what, I can drift today. I can take my eyes off of Jesus, you know, because I'll just catch up tomorrow. I can procrastinate until there's a point where you look around and, and you don't even know who you are anymore. You've given into so much sin, it has destroyed your life. The warning for us this morning from the author of Hebrews is that we would wake up. Wake up. He says it here in verse 12. Look at this. Take care. That's Hebrews for wake up. Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you, be in any of you, an evil, unbelieving heart, 
leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it's called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence to the end. Let me end with this. Even in those three verses, we're given three very simple encouragements to avoid drifting away from Jesus. Let me tell you what, you have an enemy. I hope you know that. I hope every day that you wake up and you set foot out into the world, you know that you have an enemy that is prowling around seeking to destroy you. Yes, John 10, 10 says that he came, Jesus came to give us life and life to full, but we have an enemy who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And he doesn't clock in, and he doesn't clock out. Every day I have my sinful flesh, I have a dark and depraved world, and I have an enemy who is actively working to do what, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians? To separate you and me from a pure devotion in Christ Jesus. That's his goal. He can't separate me from Jesus, but he sure would love to distance our relationship. He would love for me to be caught up in sin and live in it and live in defeat and live in disobedience. He would love for me to live in the squalor of depression. He would love for me to live alone apart from the body of Christ. He would love for me to feel complacent toward God's word because he knows that will separate me from a pure devotion and intimate relationship with Jesus. That's the goal of the enemy. He would love to cause me to just day by day by day by day drift away from Jesus. And this author of Hebrews says, this is what happened to the people of Israel. Now let me give you, he says, three little quick reminders, three quick simple tips to stop that from happening. Now here's the point where I'm going to say these are ridiculously short, ridiculously simple, and I need you to to uphold your end of the deal, to listen to me and take them serious because these are game changers. Here's the first thing he says in verse 12. Look at this. Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you, in any of you, an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living Lord. Let me tell you what he means by that. Be on guard. And here's what I mean by that. If anybody's sitting here and you're thinking that would never happen to me, verse 12 is talking to you. Be on guard. Yes, it can happen to you. Yes, Every day, let me tell you what the new trend is every day I get on the news. Some new Christian celebrity or some longtime Christian is deconstructing their faith. Every day. Whether it was some worship leader that we've listened to all their songs for the last 20 years, they now don't even believe in Jesus. A couple Christian comedians that I can think of that their show's still out there on YouTube, they would now be self professed atheists. You got people who I used to, on theological sites that I very much still respect. Just in the last year, you'd have a main writer on one of those sites say, I I no longer claim Jesus Christ as Lord. These are the people that were writing the books on apologetics and some of these things before. You take your eyes off of Jesus, nobody's off limits. The enemy will wreak havoc with your faith. I think the first thing we need to understand is that, you know what, if I think that I can just kind of cruise control, that I can be biblically illiterate, and I can, I can take the sword of the Spirit, like Ephesians 6 says, and shut it, and I don't need it, and, you know, I can kind of just get a, a Devo every now and then when I turn on Instagram, or when Pastor Brad's preaching, I can come to service every now and then, but I'm not going to dig into the Word, I'm not going to deepen my faith, and, and drifting won't happen to me. Good luck. That's naive. And the enemy's licking his chops. Verse 12 is just simply saying that. What is verse 12 telling us to do? Verse 12 is telling us to take care. He's saying, be careful is what he's saying there with those two words. And then he gives us, I think, some of the best advice that's going to cap off this whole sermon series. He gives us the second thing that we ought to put into our minds. Look at this, verse 13. But exhort one another every day as long as it's called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Let me tell you what the antidote here. He says two things. One, I don't want to have spiritual drift, so you better be careful because it can happen to you. Number two, let me tell you what he said is the recipe for it. You and me. I've told you this a million times, and I'll say it again. God did not intend for us to be Lone Ranger Christians. God did not intend for you to go about your walk with Christ Jesus alone. It is a team sport. 
There are people who, who would sit here and they would listen to four weeks of sermons. And they would say, you know what? I, okay, I get it. The Bible says that I'm commanded to be a part of the, the fellowship in the body of believers. I know that this is what's good for me. I know it's best for me. I know this is necessary that I surround myself with other believers in, in the Lord Jesus. We can't even accomplish the commission unless we do this together. And yet there will still be people who will sit in these pews who have no relationship with another Christian in this church or a small group and they will still get up out of here and walk out of here. Why? Because they don't feel like it's necessary. And they don't feel like they want to because those are the two reasons that we do anything in life the only reason you do anything in your life is because you either want to or you feel like you need to but there will be people who have listened to me preach for four weeks listen to every single one of these sermons and they still will try to be a lone ranger christian and here's my last ditch effort be warned drift is coming because you know what you weren't designed to walk this path by yourself and if you think you can defeat sin and walk with all of the obstacles in front of you by yourself you will lose you will put that pride down some of you won't get involved in the community of god because you're prideful and i'm trying to warn you it's going to be too late The joy of being in community is this, that inevitably when we all get distracted, because it happens, every single one of us, let me tell you something about you and me. This is why I say I, one thing we share in common is that we're sinful. Let me just describe what it looks like. We sin. And here's what sin is. It's any moment that I take my eyes off of the author and perfecter of my faith and I start to kind of gaze over the, the fence off the path and say, yeah, that looks nice, though. Hold on, Jesus. I mean, I'm only going to glance away for a second. Let me just check out this over here. But here's what happens. Here's how spiritual drift happens. You take that one little step. You know, I can take the week off from Jesus. I don't have to be in the Word. I don't, I don't have to do that. We, we all do this because this is who we are, sheep. It's just when we step off of that path, it gets easier to step even further away. But like, oh, look at this thing. This is amazing. Oh, a butterfly. Let me chase that bad boy over here. And you just wander and wander and you cross one line and one line and one line until you turn around and you can't even see where you came from anymore. We all will do it. You will. By yourself. If you've ever been in a part of an addiction program, what do they tell you? Watch out. What's the acronym? HALT. Look out for the moments when you're hungry, alone, lonely, and tired. Because if you leave yourself alone, hungry, and lonely, and tired, you will give in to whatever you're addicted to. And let me tell you what you're addicted to, because I'm addicted to it. Sin. Disobedience. And verse 13 says, let me tell you, the joy to stop you from wandering away from the Lord Jesus is other Christians. Thank God for other Christians, other followers of Christ, who would see me start to do this, and being like, oh, that's nice. And they'd be like, uh-uh, nope. Get back over here. Oh, man, this looks nice. I'm going to just take Jesus. Nope, nope, back over here. Thank God for other brothers and sisters in the Lord who keep us, one another, on the path of righteousness. Thank God for that. The antidote for spiritual drift, according to verse 13, is one another's in the church the community it's an amazing thing i love that that word exhort is this the greek word exhort is parakaleo in the greek para means to come alongside and kaleo means to call out get the image of cross country again you know one of the things in our meet when when people were faster than you on your team would finish they wouldn't just go to the house they would get a bottle of water and then they would come back onto the course and cheer you on those who are still running this is what we're supposed to be doing for one another. Not only do I want to keep my other teammates on the path, but I can spur them on. Let me tell you what I need. Look, I, I'm fighting sin like you. And it would be easy for me when left alone by myself to get focused on my problems and get focused on condemnation and get focused on, on physical needs and all the stuff that goes on in the world. I need somebody. I need Christians who will look at me and be like, Brad, don't take your eyes off of Jesus. When I start to believe lies from the enemy, I need other believers who will be like, no, 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 let's open up this truth. 
Let's open up this trick. You're believing a lie, friend. Let me share the truth with you. That's what verse 13 says. We'll conquer spiritual drift. And then last, there's this last encouragement. Look at verse 14. He says, For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Here's the last thing. Once you surround yourself with other believers, one, don't get prideful and think these things can't happen to you. Understand the world that you live in and the flesh that engulfs you and realize that we need others and then it's just hang on and don't quit. Don't quit. It's a call for, for perseverance here. Let me tell you something. I think there are lots of people who are missing out on the joys of godly family and all the joys of care and accountability and confession and fellowship and deepened understanding of God's word. And I wish I could kind of unzip you like a robot and program you to understand how awesome this is and cause you to do it. But I know that there will be a lot of people who will hear these words that are members of our church and they'll still decide to try to do this by themselves. And I pray as a, in this time that you would at least just be warned. It's a matter of time. I pray you would respond this morning. I pray maybe you haven't any of the weeks, but maybe you come to this altar and say, God, I, I don't want that. I don't want to drift. I'm tired of drifting right now. How much further can you drift away? Why not turn it around now? Why not come and get before the Lord and say, look, I'm tired of wandering off the path pull me back in and then help let us help you find some brothers and sisters in the Lord back out here at our our kitchen table and say hey look I'm going to surround me with some men surround me with some women you need men and women of God I'm going to pray for us as we have an opportunity to respond to God's word this morning can't get any more practical than that the family of God is a glorious thing and I pray that you'll respond that God would lead you to, to join Get involved and surround yourself with brothers and sisters, family of God. Let me pray for us. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for how it challenges us and how it encourages us. God, I'm so thankful that you have given us everything we need. You've given us your spirit. You've given us your son. You've given us your word. But God, you've given us, yes, spiritual gifts. You've given us one another, though, God, and Shame on us for forsaking that and then wondering why it is that we were hungry, why it is that we wander. God, I pray that you would give us a conviction for one another. Father, you would give a conviction for any of those that are standing on the sidelines or just sitting on pews that they would take a step to get involved in the deeper, smaller community of the church to get to know one another and let others know them and care. We need it for survival we need it for perseverance we need it for endurance God I pray in these moments that you would speak to your people and they would respond however you lead pray that they'd come and maybe just lay down some sin at the altar in front of you maybe they get up and they go pray with with somebody maybe they go to the foyer and say plug me in I need some people whatever it is God I pray that we would respond in truth to you It is Jesus all in your name. Amen. Church, you come and you respond as the Lord leads you.